So hello and welcome to our first Teaching with Technology Brown Bag of 2023, No More Death by PowerPoints, Creating Engaging Presentation. So I'm very pleased today to introduce Mr. Brandon Henry, who is the technical lead for the ETI. He has a master's degree in instructional technology from the University of South Florida. Mr. Henry's been working in education for over 25 years, producing online course materials and developing engaging instructional graphics and animations. He's been working here at USIS since 2006, and many of you may have seen his work for USIS, like the neuroscience intro, accreditation videos, and other animation projects for USU. I'm also really happy to introduce today Mr. Tracy Jackson, who is the new ETI's Green Room Studio Tech. He is a U.S. Navy veteran and was previously stationed at Walter Reed in the early to mid-1990s when it was called the National Naval Medical Center Bethesda. He is a video content creator with over 20 years of production and content creation and motion graphic experience. He has a degree in digital media and web technologies. He's produced, directed, and provided post-production support for lots of TV broadcasts, commercials, as well as worked on full-length and feature films. He describes himself as being a media professional who is engrossed in utilizing his passion for video production and storytelling to help people expand their ideas through authentic content and create strong connections with their audiences. So I'm going to turn it over to Mr. Henry. All right. Thanks, Dina. Uh, welcome, everybody. So I'm Brandon Henry, and as Dina said, I've been working in educational media for um, coming up on 30 years now, and I've noticed things changing with students over the years. Most of our students are now at an age where they uh, have grown up surrounded by media with internet, movies, video games, basically the sum of all human knowledge right at the tip of their fingers. So many places to get the information they need. And uh, in order for us to compete for their attention, we need to think of ways to streamline our PowerPoint presentations to make them inform informative and engaging rather than dull and deathly. Um, this presentation is not just based on our opinions, but have been written about by other scholars such as Edward Tufte, Richard Mayer, and John Sweller. And we'll have some links for you at the end of the presentation that you, uh, if you want to look into this further. In this presentation, we're going to cover three of the most common issues that we've seen with presentations over the last couple of years, uh, which are cognitive overload caused by too much information on the screen, um, image quality, um, and slide design. So let's start out with a quick overview of cognitive load theory, and then we can uh, get into how our presentations can have an effect on the students' learning. Um, an Australian psychologist named John Sweller developed the cognitive load theory, which explains how a person's working memory is divided into three activity spaces. Intrinsic load is the sort of the mental effort demanded by the task information. Um, in other words, taking in all the variables during a project management or learning a difficult subject like calculus. Uh, the intrinsic load will be the same regardless of external factors, although those external factors may add additional difficulty. Extraneous load is the effort imposed by the environment. Uh, for example, background noise or other distractions that can disrupt a person. And this could also be the result of a person's delivery style and presentation design. And germane load is the effort needed to convert new information into mental schemas and stable long-term learning. So let's jump back to the extraneous load. Um, oftentimes, I see slides like this where the creator is discussing a, partic a particular topic, and they're trying to cram everything into the screen uh, so they can talk about it. And the problem with this is uh, you might be talking about one thing over here. Um, but the students are looking at a totally different place on your slide. Um, it's kind of like if you've ever been in a cafeteria having a discussion with someone and you overhear someone else's conversation and they mention your name or maybe they're talking about something like who had the best deal on sodas or whatever it is, but your attention is now elsewhere. And this results in a cognitive overload due to the split attention effect. And this is kind of the same thing your students are dealing with when they're required to split their attention between multiple items on the screen and what you're describing. So to lessen some of that cognitive overload, we want them to focus on one point at a time. Remember, there's no limit to how many slides you can create. So go ahead and break up your slides to have one focus point per slide. 
And you, you might have to prep your students a little bit and say, okay, the next few slides are going to cover modeling customer dynamics or whatever your topic is. But you can have that topic on the screen to help kind of keep a visual uh, organizer on your slides. And one of the other benefits to breaking up your slides into, into multiples is if you stay on a particular slide for too long, because you have too much to cover, your audience will start to daydream and, and wander off. So breaking up your slides kind of helps keep the presentation moving. So here's an example. While this slide may appear nice at first glance, there is still a lot of text associated with each item. And, you know, there's still too much information on each screen. So the one main thing that I would do with this screen is I would change it and, and put those three topics on separate slides. And maybe even where the circles are, I would break those out into separate slides too, if you're gonna discuss those as topics. Um, and something to consider, you know, when you're building your slides, if you have a graphic and you think, well, I'm gonna put this on the slide for, for reference, but you don't really talk about it, just leave it off. There's no reason to put it on there. Okay, quick pop quiz. Uh, when I showed you the soda cans a few screens back, did you guys notice that I had a couple of extra ones on here that aren't actually sodas? Um, so one of the things that you want to, um, you know, consider is putting distracting items on your screen that you aren't talking about. Um, and when I had that screen up before, I didn't really prompt you on what I wanted you to focus on from that slide. So you know, you were processing probably, oh, there's a sale on sodas, uh, you know, and, and the quantities down below. And if I were to ask you, can you describe what, what sodas were on screen? You, you probably wouldn't because you would have gathered, uh, you know, bunched those all into one, one group of things. Uh, you want your students to focus on what you want them to. Don't assume that people are focusing on what you think they are, um, you know, and, and just keep all the extraneous stuff off. So, Along the same lines of, of too much information on the screen is uh, too much text. So you wanna keep the text on your slides to a minimum and use images and graphics to support your message and keep the audience engaged. A good measure of text is the six by six rule. So what that is is six bullet points on screen with no more than six words on each bullet point. So I've seen some slides that kind of look like someone was writing a thesis or whatever, and, and hopefully you haven't done this, um, but too much text to read um, is, is really distracting for students. Um, I mean, even with this slide, you really have to kind of focus on what the information is to, to read it. There's a lot here. This is a little bit easier. Uh, you wanna highlight the most important information and make it as succinct as possible. And notice also what I'm doing with my bullets. Um, I have them appear, you know, and talk about them when I when I want to. If you have all of your bullets and your text on screen at, at the same time, your audience is going to try to read everything, and everybody reads at different paces. And so, you know, you might have a whole classroom of, of people, um, you know, at different points in your slide than than what you want them to be. So, if possible, you can make this even uh, more visual using graphics. Now, something like this slide, if I wanted to go into to more detail for each topic, I would probably have those appear one at a time and then discuss them uh, as I brought them on screen. Um, either way you do it, you want to give your audience time to read. Um, and if you have a lot of text um, that you want to provide the students, you might consider giving them a separate document like a PDF or something, or if you'd rather not create a separate document, you can include all of that extra information in the notes section of your slides and hand that out to your students to use as reference for their uh, lessons. Okay, moving on, let's talk about images now. And this is sort of the uh, ooh, ah moment of your slides. You know, this is the, 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 the beauty part. So if an image though is confusing or unclear, it can make it a lot more difficult for the audience to understand and retain the information being presented. And this is especially true for charts and graphs, and we'll talk about that here in a few minutes. But you want to make sure that you choose graphics uh, that help relay your message, and you really want to find high-quality images. And sometimes it's really easy to do a quick Google search and find something, especially for like anatomy and other medical images that, that we tend to find a lot here at USIS. Um, you might find an image that works, but it might not be suitable for your presentation based on size 
or even copyright, um, you know, which is a, a different discussion. But you want to avoid these blurry images um, or low quality graphics. And you can do a search now for Creative Commons images that are free to download and use. Some may ask you to um, give attribution or may have other restrictions for use, but you can usually find a pretty large variety of items that are, are legal to use um, for your presentations. Oh, and I might add that um, if there is a specific graphic or illustration that you need, you can always contact the ETI and we would be happy to discuss your project with you. This brain image here was created by our uh, most excellent medical illustrator, Mike Gallagher. Um, and we also have another brown bag that Mike presented uh, a couple months ago called Working with the Medical Illustrator. And you can find that on our UCIS YouTube page under the um, ETI playlist. Okay, so I mentioned charts and graphs. Um, your data charts should be clear, and I might add relevant to your uh, focus point. So this here is an example of a chart that has a lot going wrong with it. Um, first of all, this this is a chart to show what sandwiches people didn't like or voted no to. And as you can see, all of the data points are, are very similar. There's not really an indication of accuracy for the numbers that are shown. And not only is the chart extremely difficult to interpret, the focus is all wrong. So let me ask the audience here, as you look at this, what element on this chart kind of do you draw your, is, is your eye drawn to? Since each box is similar and all the data points are basically at the same point, the only thing to really focus on is the uh, the text. That's really the only contrasting thing to look at. And those are snarky comments by the creator that really don't belong there. Here's a an attention getter. So now we've got a big, bright, beautiful graphic here. Um, this is kind of a better representation of important data and what should be shown. Um, you know, based on the last chart, who really cares what the 17th most popular sandwich is? Um, so I've kind of recreated this and replaced the useless information and brought you the most important information, like what are the top two sandwiches in the US? And <clears throat> something like this, an infographic, if you're able to, to uh, create an infographic rather than a chart, those are often more memorable ways to relay information rather than you know just plain old charts and tables. Nothing wrong with them. Um, and if you wanted to create something like this, but you didn't know how, again, you can always call the ETI and we'd be happy to discuss your um, graphic needs. So remember when you're when you're showing data, it's your job to explain what the audience should get out of the data, not for them to sit there and try to interpret everything that's on the screen. Um, so similar to graphic quality is the quality of your slide design. So I'm going to go over uh, just a couple quick tips um, when you're designing your slides to think of um, to help alleviate some of the cognitive overload for your students. So obviously color choice is very important. Um, you can see what a mess too many colors can create and um, bad contrast. So if you notice on here, there's only one or two sets of text that are easier to read than the others. Um, so if you're not sure what colors to go with, limit yourself to like two or, th two or three colors. You wanna have plenty of contrast between the text and the background um, to make the text readable. And you know, when you're working in PowerPoint or something, Microsoft has a bunch of built-in color palettes that you can choose from to help eliminate or, or come up with ugly colors like I had on the last one. And there's also a website that you can go to um, called happyhues.co or .co. And uh, this allows you to see kind of different colors um, all together with graphics on the screen and, and, and fonts and backgrounds and different things like that. So it's really important that your audience can read your slides. Um, this, this is an actual screenshot uh, that I received from my daughter's teacher. Um, she's in second grade, and this had all the important information for all the chaperones for a field trip they were, that they were going to go on. Um, and this was about three scrolling pages on my iPhone that I was trying to read. Um, and there was a lot of important information on there, and I, I couldn't read it. I had to email her and ask her to resend it with a with a regular font. So choosing the right font for your presentation is critical to keep your audience engaged also. If they can't read your slides, 
that adds to the extraneous load and they'll find something else to focus on. So something to consider when you're building your slides is to you know, limit your font selection to one to two um, and stay away from cursive or hand-drawn fonts. I know they, they kind of add a little fun to it, but they're really difficult to read on presentations. Um, you can mix up the weights of one font to give some contrast like uh, bold and regular if you wanted to set up kind of hierarchies within your text. And size makes a difference on how your audience will interact with your slide too. Um, you know, size can help direct your eye around the content. I'm assuming that uh, most of you read that big block first and, and read them in the order that I created. And that's just simply with size and, and a little bit of contrast with the text. You wanna be sure that your text is big enough to read, um, especially if you're doing a live presentation for the class in the classroom. Um, you wanna see what your slides look like from the back of the room. So if you get a chance to, you know, put them up on screen and go back where the students might be sitting at the back, um, I would highly recommend you, you do that because anything that's not readable on your slides needs to be um, enlarged. So I know that none of you have ever put anything like this together in your presentations, but uh, really the only readable thing on this chart is the headline. And beyond that, there's not really any point to having this on a presentation slide. There is almost nothing readable on this. Um, so try not to do this. Please don't do this. Um, this would be a good thing to give as a handout so someone could sit down and actually study it because there is a lot of information on there. Um, think about the items that you want to speak to on a chart and just develop your slides to those items. Oh, look, another quiz. Okay, so blank is the spice of life. And um, some of you might choose cinnamon, um, but the answer is variety. So if you show the same slides over and over again, you're, you're going to lose your audience. Um, so to help break up the monotony, um, you know, use quizzes, ask questions, um, interesting factoids. You know, you could totally do a separate screen, kind of like I did with the, the infographic thing. Um, just change it up a little bit. Uh, you can even bring in guest speakers to team teach across departments and just to, to have a little bit of difference in there. Um, and then, you know, if you can link in some videos or animations, uh, that also helps to break up the, the monotony of your presentation. So the ETI also specializes in animation. Um, if you have a concept that you're having difficulty teaching, um, give us a call and, and we can sit down with you and, and talk about the information and, and figure out ways to, um, you know, present that information in a new and dynamic way. Okay, so let's hear from Tracy Jackson, our ETI video technician, um, on some of the capabilities that ETI can provide in our studio. Thanks, Brandon, for sharing that information with us. I'm Tracy, the ETI studio technician, and I want to share some of the presentation methods we offer in the ETI studio. But before I do that, I'd like to share two tips that will make the recording process easier for the presenter and allow us the opportunity to collaborate with you on how to create the best visual presentation for the learner. I'd like to call them the two P's, prepare and practice. These two points go hand in hand when trying to provide the best learning experience for the student. Why prepare? Why practice? In my many years of video production, I've seen the same scenario repeatedly take place. Suddenly information that you've reviewed thousands of times before become almost foreign once the lights and the cameras turn on. Remember, a video is only as good as the people who appear in it. Since there's no audience, lecturing is different than presenting in a classroom. There's no engagement between you and the student, nor is there any facial expressions for questions or thoughts that might be going through someone's mind at the time you're presenting. So our greatest recommendation to you is prepare and practice, practice, practice. The studio is available for practice sessions, but you must schedule them. This way you can get a feel for what you will experience on the day of your recording. Now let's look at some presentation methods that we have available. In the ETI studio, we have the capability of using green screen technology known as chroma keying to allow for full screen graphic displays and the ability to interact with the presentation like I'm doing. We also can create a talk show type field presentation if you're interested in having someone present with you. 
Also, we can do a split screen interview where you are asking questions and someone's answering those questions as seen here on your screen. And lastly, we can utilize props and small simulations to enhance the learning experience. Practice will be required in order to produce the best results and allow the presenter to get a sense of what is required when interacting with the camera as well as the screen. Thank you and I look forward to seeing you in the studio. Now back to Brandon for the remainder of this presentation. Okay, thanks Tracy. So um, we covered a, a, a lot of ground here in this quick little presentation. Uh, we talked about focusing your students' attention on slides and, and to use multiple slides rather than one crowded slide. Uh, we talked about minimizing text on the screen and adding all the extra stuff to the notes. Um, we talked about using visuals to support your message and the need for high quality graphics. And we also talked about a little bit about color and text selection and size and how it makes a difference on a slide design. And then we talked about some of the capabilities for ETI that we can do in the studio to help engage your students a little bit better. Thank you for watching today's Teaching with Technology Brown Bag session. You can view all Teaching with Technology Brown Bags on the USU YouTube channel under the full ETI playlist. Have a nice day.